Um, artificial intelligence, boy, guys, this is an exciting time. I spend my life traveling really around the world. I just got in last night from Orlando, and we're always covering this topic, and it has both incredible opportunities and some challenges that are keeping people awake at night. And my task this morning is to cover the dark side um, and to look at what those downsides are. I'm also going to be doing a 60-minute session later in the day, which will be a bit more balanced. But today, uh, the goal is, uh, or at least right now, the goal is to look at some of the, some of the risks and what, uh, what should we be thinking about, what should we be looking at as we go forward into, uh, into the next weeks, months, and years to come. Now, before we do that, I want to draw the distinction of what actually constitutes artificial intelligence because, uh, you know, a lot of what we're talking about is just good analytics. And, and there's nothing wrong with that, by the way. I mean, good, that's incredible stuff. The digital transformation, incremental innovation, people are getting better and better. The analytics is unbelievable. And bringing all those siloed systems together, having a seamless digital experience, it's incredible. But that's not necessarily artificial intelligence. So what constitutes artificial intelligence? Well, there's really uh, two things, I would say, uh, and different people have different opinions, but in my opinion, there's two things that we need to find. The first is some level of, of human level comprehension. And the second, which is more important, is the ability to learn. So we'll just keep that in mind as we talk about some of these darker sides, because those are integral to where those risks lie. So um, the downsides or the dark side to artificial intelligence, I'm going to really cover three primary areas, and there, there's more but we've got a 15-minute session here, so we've got to you know, look at the big ones. And the first one, I would say, without question, is job displacement. And we've heard about this in the news. We've heard about it all over the place, and it's very real, and it's coming quicker than people think, so we'll talk about that. Number two, this idea of a single monolithic AI. This is the glamorous one, right? This is what Elon Musk has talked about, and Stephen Hawking, and even Bill Gates and others. Uh, we'll talk about that as well. And third, which I think is uh, maybe the most important, is a concept that I refer to as the second wave. And I'll describe that for you in just a little bit, the second wave. But the bottom line is there are changes coming, and there's risks, and there's um, arguably some chaos on the, on the horizon. And this is actually what my, uh, what my book is about, so I'm super passionate about this topic. Uh, there is change coming, and again, it's, it's changing at a wholesale level, our culture. Uh, and so there's different leadership required. What, what, what's required to thrive amidst anarchy, for example? And I'll tell you right now, it's bold leadership. Bold leadership is what's required, and we can talk about that later. This book will be available a little bit later on in the day. So let's go into the first one, which is uh, the job displacement piece. And just with uh, the finance area in mind in particular, uh, this just came out recently. This is fascinating. came out from the Hackett Group. The number of finance employees per billion in revenue, let's say it again, the number of employee, number of finance employees per billion in revenue is already down by 40%. That's between 2004 and 2014. So people think this uh, job displacement is in the future. Guys, it's already here. It's been happening for years already, right? ERP platforms, CRM platforms, enterprise software. This is doing the job of what people used to do before. So this is happening quickly. And earlier this year uh, in China, March of this year, they uh, opened the first personless bank. So think about this. Right, we're talking about a place that has no employees. It's just 8.30 in the morning, the lights come on, the doors unlock, you can go in and conduct business, but there's no employees at all. Right, pretty interesting. Uh, and then, of course, right here in Seattle, we've got the Amazon Go stores as well, which have no cashiers. By the way, 3.4 million retail cashiers in this country. Just think about it. Think about the financial incentive that companies have to adopt this kind of technology because they can save those kinds of salaries. Unbelievable. This is what's coming. It's coming very quickly, right? So there's a study that uh, came out about two years ago from Oxford University, which was looking at all sorts of different metrics, and they hypothesized that uh, they're expecting, their conclusion was that in the United States, we could have as many as 47% of our jobs um, at risk of being displaced in the next 15 to 20 years. And that number was actually a lot lower. They did this for countries all around the world. The 47%, 47%, that's half of our jobs. That's far less than the numbers in other developing countries around the world, including China at 77% and uh, India at 69%. Unbelievable. And, and what, is all, what is driving this? As we know, there's no surprise here, it's technology. 
uh, technology. So, uh, and there's a lot of people who are hypothesizing of which jobs are most at risk. There's a lot of different models. Again, I won't pick winners there, but this is one that I think is interesting. Gives you an idea of the sorts of jobs uh, that might be at risk. And just with the credit union industry or banking in general in mind, you've got right on the top of the list, loan officers, number one, right? Number three, you got, or rather number two, receptionists and clerks. And then a little bit further down the line, you've got personal financial assistance. That's unbelievable. And I was in the mortgage business myself years ago, which was a disaster, by the way. <laughs> um, but look at what's happening now with Rocket Mortgage. And I still know a lot of people in the industry, they're starting to lose business to Rocket Mortgage. So some of them are getting out of the business. Of course, Rocket Mortgage isn't the only one. This is all emerging out of the original automated underwriting platforms from Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. But that technology is propagating in all sorts of ways, and it's accelerating. Right? We've also got... Uh, the robo-advisors, which are emerging, like Betterment, and we've got, uh, of course, we've got Wealthfront as well. And now we've got this unicorn, Robinhood. Unbelievable. This stuff is coming really, really quickly. But, of course, we've been through this before, right? This in the 1980s when they introduced the ATM machines, right? Everyone was like, my gosh, all the tellers are going to lose their jobs. Did that happen? It didn't happen. In fact, the total number of tellers continued to increase by the slower rate, by the way, but they continue to increase. How did that happen? It's very important. It turns out that if you automate some of the repetitive tasks, like withdrawals and deposits, right, essentially you need fewer tellers per branch to make it functional, right, which lowers the break-even of what it cons- what it, what's required to open a new branch in a new, new neighborhood. So all of a sudden, banks were opening neighborhoods in all sorts of different neighborhoods where before they were only in the city center. And so now there's way more branches overall, fewer tellers in each branch, but when you add them all up totally, you've got more tellers overall because it lowered the break-even. Technology lowered the break-even, which allowed it to proliferate. Very interesting, right? And the, the tellers that were left, of course, were doing more strategic activities. Now, you contrast this, on the other side, by the travel industry, right? Didn't work out quite the same way there. As online revenues continued to increase in the travel industry, the number of travel agents continued to decrease, right? So we've got two opposing models here, right? And the real question is, are we going to evolve in the way of travel agents, or are we going to evolve in the way of bank tellers, right? Interesting questions. But let's go beyond what we've talked about so far in terms of what AI could do in our broader society. And of course, we just heard in the first presentation facial recognition and just the more broad uh, uh, image and object recognition, which is finding use cases all over the place. Uh, 1.8 million security personnel, we're seeing this technology right now in uh, in, uh, airports. Um, They're looking at new ways to replace the TSA security checkpoints with facial recognition. In fact, uh, very interesting. So airports, hotels, hospitals, stadiums, any large facility like that, it's a leading, they're early innovators. You can look at the technologies that are happening there and you know that as that technology propagates, the cost will come down. And so it'll start, we'll see it in smaller and smaller businesses, including credit unions and maybe eventually in our homes. But the bottom line is it's going to affect security jobs. Uh, Next up, we've got the natural language processing right, which is, that's turning the corner right now. Uh, Unbelievable. We heard about chatbots earlier on, but social bots, in other words, the ability to speak, think about Siri, Google Now, Amazon Alexa, right? Even now, you can call banks, probably including many of yours, and the automated phone tree will say, hey, you can say, check my balance, or, you know, what's the address, or make a transfer, or whatever. And maybe that accounts for 10% of inquiries today, but I guarantee in two years, three years, that'll be up to 50%, 60%. Imagine the salaries. Companies with, in some cases, thousands, tens of thousands of employees. Imagine the challenge just in training those people and getting consistent delivery of protocol and how much easier it would be to do it through a technology platform. Three million call center workers in this country. Next up, commercial drivers. 3.5 million commercial drivers in this country. Guys, this is coming so much faster than people. So city driving is the most complex, the most obstacles, right? Less obstacles is freeways. What's got less obstacles than freeways? Agriculture, right? And you go, like the combines in Iowa, I was just there last month. Those combines are driving themselves. You can map your farm down to the square inch. 
right? Those, they're driving themselves, it's already going. I think trucks are gonna, some state is gonna pass legislation. We don't know which one, but some state is gonna pass legislation. We'll see trucks uh, hub to hub, long haul trucking, automated uh, auto autonomous vehicles, I would say by the end of next year. And city driving, uh, five years, I would say, a significant thing. So this job displacement piece is coming and it's coming quick. I'll go into more detail, by the way, in my longer session later on. But the second one, is the big one. That's the one that everyone wants to talk about. Um, this idea of a single monolithic AI, because the deal is if it's, a, if it's evolving along an exponential curve, then as soon as one AI gets significantly in the lead, you can't catch up. In fact, the difference between the number one and number two spot will continue to get bigger, even if they're evolving along the same exponential curve, because the one who's ahead, the, the, diff the delta just keeps getting bigger and bigger, right? And even up until very recently, the largest supercomputer uh, in the world was in China, running 3.2 million Intel cores. Unbelievable, in fact, the two uh, fastest supercomputers uh, in the world have been in China up until very recently, uh, but just in, in the summer, uh, uh, IBM launched their Summit supercomputer in Tennessee, which is faster. But the bottom line is we're talking about an enormous amount of computing power. So maybe it's just a matter of time, right? <laughs> It's still pretty far out. Now, the fact that it's far out doesn't make it any less of a concern, to be, to be fair. But is it an imminent threat? No, it really is not uh, today. I would say 15 years from now, we got something to talk about. But even today, we have some kind of creepy things happening, right? This is Sophia, uh, this uh, humanoid robot. I have lost speaking gigs to Sophia. There's no joke. She's a uh, $45,000 speaker. She speaks at conferences all over the world, including Saudi Arabia recently. Uh, pretty crazy. I and mean, of course, there's people talking about militarizing artificial intelligence, which is very scary. And these things have all been depicted in the movies, right? And we have some, you know, very apocalyptic scenarios that people uh, always talk about. By the way, this is a real photograph. That is astonishing to me. So, but there's also a lot of people spending a lot of time and a lot of experts really trying to put some limits on this and trying to govern how it's evolving. Uh, companies including OpenAI, which was founded by Elon Musk, but there are others. And I think that there are people working hard to try and, and make this sustainable and avoid some of the, the biggest risks. There's no way for me or anyone at this stage to, to really anticipate exactly how this is going to evolve. It's just, it's not realistic. But it's, I would say at this point, it's a real risk, but we're talking 15 years, I think, before there's any real uh, threats that we have to consider. Now, the third one, uh, which is the one I mentioned right at the beginning, and I think this is the one uh, that gets pretty scary, and it's, it's, I would argue it's already here. So this idea of the, the second wave, whenever new technology comes, right, whenever new technology is developed, at the beginning you have the first wave, right? And the first wave is, it includes, right, government, it includes academia, it includes business, right? So those are the big players. They, for the most part, they play by the rules. I mean, of course, there's exceptions, but for the most part, they're, they're playing within expectations, let's say, right? But then afterwards, when the technology becomes cheaper and ubiquitous, everyone can use it, then you've got that second wave, and it goes out to everybody, right? All these people who have far more creativity collectively than the original first wave did when they launched the technology. Right? And this is exactly a great example of this is what has happened in social media. Right? When first social media first came out, right, we had the, the standard players, right? government, academia, business, using social media, basically playing within the rules. Then eight years later, we have organizations like ISIS using social media to spread their message of hate. And we have groups like Anonymous who are using social media to recruit new members, right? Really crazy stuff. Well, I can tell you right now, I guarantee it. There's, there's, no, there's no debate on this. The exact same thing is gonna happen with artificial intelligence, right? What do we have today? Today we have the usual suspects. We've got people in government using it. We got people, why? why? Because it's still expensive, it's still new. Everyone talks about the first user advantage, but those people pay the most. 
Right? There's, a big, there's a lot to be said for this second user advantage because it's cheaper. Right? Like how long can you wait before you pull the trigger? Because every, every, every month you wait, those costs are going to come down and those capabilities are going to go up. But today we've got the usual suspects are developing artificial intelligence. And it's incredible. It's super exciting, to be totally honest with you. But I guarantee at some point when this becomes ubiquitous, already today Google TensorFlow is an open source platform for, for machine learning. Right? There's all sorts of things that are developing and we will soon have a second wave of users. In our, imagine a 14 year old kid who builds an AI whose sole responsibility or objective is to go out and cause chaos and break stuff. That will happen. I promise it'll happen. So what are we talking about? At the end of the day, it's a cybersecurity discussion. And that's here today. You all know it. You're battling it. And it's a cat and mouse game. It's a cat and mouse game. And they know each other. You know how they say cops and criminals quite, quite often they know each other after a while because they're, they're running in similar circles? Same thing, the people who are doing antivirus software and the people who are hackers, sometimes it's the same people. <laughs> they're just going home at night and programming at night. I mean, th these are, it's a cat and mouse game and it will continue to be a cat and mouse game. We have to try and keep up. That's, this one to me is the big risk. I would say at the end of the day, the two ones we have to be worried about right now, and again, within the context of a short 15 minute session this morning, uh, number one is job displacement. How is that going to affect not only your credit union, but your community? It's gonna affect our communities. And, and it's not the young kids we have to worry about. It's what do you do with the 53 year old guy who's been driving trucks for 30 years? What does he do? Right? It's very interesting what's going to happen there. So that's number one. And number two is uh, the second wave. And that's a cybersecurity discussion. That's going to come. Artificial intelligence, the cost is coming down. All sorts of new oper um, you know, tools and open source options are emerging. Uh, this will be gaining ground in the years to come. So um, I'll stop there. I appreciate your time this morning. Uh, some books will be available later on. And I've got a 60-minute session later in the day. For now, thanks so much for being here this morning.